Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Gautam Das, uh, and I'm the Associate Dean for Research, College of Engineering. And it's my great pleasure to continue to be the host for this Friday uh, sessions on the College of Engineering Virtual Brown Bag Series. Uh, today's presentation's title is uh, The Secrets of Ancient Roman Construction Material. And, uh, you know, it's, in, it's an intriguing topic, uh, is an understatement, and I'm also looking forward to hearing more about it, as I'm sure all of you are. Uh, the presentation is going to be done by Professor Wadda Asraf. She's an assistant professor in the Civil Engineering Department here at UTA in the College of Engineering. And uh, I'll just introduce her with a description of a brief bio. Um, she did her PhD from Purdue University in 2017. Her work on sustainable infrastructure material led to Purdue's College of Engineering Outstanding Graduate Research Award. She has also received the DARPA Young Faculty Award in 2020 and the ASCE Excellence in Civil Engineering Education Teaching Fellowship in 2019. Uh, Dr. Asraf uh, secured research funding from numerous uh, agencies in a very short time in her career, including uh, the National Science Foundation, uh, DARPA, Texas Department of Transportation, defense logistics agencies, and so on. Her research interests include durability, performances of concrete, multi-scale characterization, and the development of sustainable infrastructure materials. With this, I'd like to invite Dr. Asraf to start the presentation. Well, uh, thank you very much, Professor Das, and uh, hello, everyone. I think you can see my screen, and also uh, you can see my pointer. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about Roman concrete, but we will learn not only about the secrets, we will also learn why it is different compared to our modern concrete and how we can actually use those ancient knowledge to develop a better material for our today's application. So it's equally about the secrets and also about the developing of new durable material. And I hope you'll enjoy this presentation. Um, so research motivation for us is, is pretty simple. You can see the pictures here. On the left side, I have the figure of a uh, picture of Pantheon uh, in Rome, Italy. It was constructed almost 2000 years ago. And even after this 2000 years, it's, it's kind of in perfect shape. There is no major sign of distress and um, it's, it's performing very well. On the right side, I have some figures from our um, recent structures made out of modern concrete. We have pavements and here on the top image, it's a column. And this modern concrete structure, it is showing distress very soon. And in, in general, uh, for modern concrete, if we get around 50 to 60 years of service life, we feel very happy. But Roman concrete, it lasted for 2000 years and it's still performing well. So there is a huge gap in the durability performance. And that's why you want to understand why this Roman concrete it lasted for so long and why our modern concrete is failing and what is the problem here. Now, um, let's get back to Roman concrete. It's actually a very interesting material and um, the ancient Roman engineers, they use this material for varieties of the structure. Here I have again a um, picture of Colosseum, which is example of massive concrete construction. For this structure, they actually used 700,000 tons of concrete. So that's a huge amount of concrete and um, they could do that using this ancient material. Another example um, is this bridge in Rome. It was constructed 1900 years ago. Now it is exposed to moisture, which in general, we say that the moisture exposure condition is not good for concrete, but this bridge, it lasted for 1900 years. It is still in service, so it's still serving the community. So that's why uh, something really interesting about Roman concrete is going on. Now, the most interesting aspect of this Roman concrete is actually the seawater application. 
What is interesting because uh, seawater represents a very harsh environmental condition. So seawater, it has a very high alkaline environment. It also contains some ions like chlorides or sulfates, and these ions actually are not good for concrete. It damages concrete. Now here you can see on the left side is the um, are the sea walls constructed using Roman concrete. There are signs of distresses. However, the sea walls are still there even after 2000 years. Whereas in case of a modern concrete, if it is exposed to seawater, usually we see the sign of distresses within just a few weeks. And uh, that's that's why the seawater environment of our Portland cement concrete is not doing good in this condition. And that's one of the main reasons for this project that we want to understand what is happening in case of Roman concrete and how we can use that. Now, um, Roman concrete, it is an ancient material and most of the techniques actually lost in history. Um, however, there are some ancient books that provided us some background information that we can actually use. One of the book is um, on architecture. This is again uh, later on published as 10 books on architecture around 30 to 15 BC. This book was written by uh, Marcus Vitruvius Polio. He was an architect, civil engineer and military engineer. What he did in this book, he collected um, all the information related to ancient Roman structures and it, uh, he compiled those for Julius Caesar. So that book actually gave us some information about the, what is the recipe and the material and so on. There are a few, uh, when I say few, there are one or two books from that same time period that also tells us about the uh, basic mechanism recipe of the concrete. So in this slide, again, um, this first few line, I'm just directly quoting from one of those ancient book. And basically what it uh, tells us that if you uh, collect dust from the hills of Futurely, Futurely is a location in Italy, if you collect that dust and if you expose that dust to seawater, it hardens, it becomes like a stone mass and it becomes impregnable to the waves. So that's that's what the basic information we have, that you have to collect this certain material from this particular location. And that material, if you expose it to seawater, it becomes harder and it, it acts like a, uh, basically it acts like a stone mass. And again, this uh, Puteoli, this is basically a city in Italy. On the left side, you can see the old image of Puteoli Harbor. And on the right side, we have the uh, modern, uh, in Puteoli right now, we know as Posuli. So that modern Posuli Harbor. So uh, people have been trying to understand these Roman concrete secrets for the last few decades. And there have been some research uh, going on on this topic. So some of the researchers, they collected the dust from that exact same location to understand what is magical about that dust. And they realized that uh, those dust from that particular location, those are basically volcanic ash. That volcanic ash, it has certain properties. Those are amorphous aluminum silicates. So when you mix that volcanic ash with lime and expose it to seawater, it actually reacts and provides the strength. And again, as I mentioned, there have been some projects going on to understand the Roman concrete. One of the remarkable project is Roma Con project. It started in 2001. So what they did this researcher, they collected several um, concrete core samples from those ancient structures and they looked into the microstructure that what is happening there. So this is one of that uh, piece of Roman concrete sample. Again, remarkable contribution in this area is by Dr. Jackson. She looked into the microstructure of this system. And what we realized is that uh, these ancient Roman engineers, first of all, they use volcanic ash and lime. In addition to that, they also use volcanic aggregates. As you can see in this, um, in this cross section of the core sample that um, the Roman concrete, it contains lava fragments. And it also contains pumice type of uh, aggregate. So pumice is basically volcanic aggregate. 
And um, so this type of aggregate, it actually reacts in the presence of seawater. So it's, it's porous. For our modern concrete, we do not like pumice, but the Roman concrete, they actually used pumice and they provided um, very good quality of concrete. So if I just summarize like um, all of our background knowledge of Roman concrete, this is what we know so far. First of all, they started these ancient Roman, <coughs> sorry, ancient Roman engineers. They started uh, using volcanic ash and slick lime from those ancient books. We know that the ratio was around 3 to 1 to 3 to 1. After that, they added volcanic aggregates and then they added seawater. After mixing all of this, they, they got some sort of dry mix and they compacted into different shapes to get their uh, Roman concrete. This is what we know from those ancient books. And using the modern techniques, later on we realized that whenever you mix volcanic ash with slick lime, there is a particular reaction. We call it pozzolanic reaction. During that reaction, it forms some interesting mineral phases. As an example, it forms calcium aluminum silicate hybrid gel. This is kind of like a, a glue. It binds all of our aggregates and everything together. And basically, it's providing the strength. However, we also learned that due to the presence of seawater, which is kind of alkaline and it has different types of ions, it, it continues to um, it continues to modify the microstructure. And eventually, we finally get some very interesting mineral phases that includes CASH gel, that is again calcium aluminum silicate hydrate gel. We also get some sort of uh, zeolites we get aluminum tobermolite. Um, we then learned that um, uh, that these specific mineral phases, these geolars tobermolite, it has very interesting morphological characteristics. These are some scanning electron microscopic images showing those uh, mineral phases. So what happens is that those mineral phases, it has either needle-like morphology or plate-like morphology those needles or plates, it can actually bridge the micro cracks. So when those phases are present in, um, in our concrete, it acts like in situ micro reinforcement. And because of this in situ micro reinforcement, our Roman concrete, it, it is uh, showing this remarkable performance or the extraordinary resiliency. So um, if I summarize about Roman concrete, what these ancient Roman engineers actually did, they used volcanic ash, which was locally available material. They used seawater, slack lime, and not so good quality of aggregate. And eventually they produced concrete with extremely high durability. And this durability mainly came from those um, specific mineral phases that we have seen in the microstructure. Now, the question is, OK, so Roman concrete, it was a very good material, but we are not using Roman concrete anymore. So we are using some different type of material that is modern concrete and it's not performing that well. So our goal is to understand is to capitalize on this ancient technology and provide um, or develop better concrete for today's application. And to do that, we need to understand what are the problems we have in our current material system, our modern concrete. So let's get back to modern concrete, but a little bit of history first. So this concrete technology uh, is actually not a new material. It's a, it's a, this concrete technology is very old. And uh, the first application of concrete or concrete-like material was reported in Egypt during the construction of pyramids. They used a mixture of gypsum and lime to connect the limestone blocks. And after that, of course, the Roman concrete, which is a durable material, we all like it. But the main change uh, we have seen that in 1824, when Joseph Asbin from England, he invented Portland cement. Portland cement is actually a very interesting material. It gives us good strength and gives the strength very quickly. Some other landmark, uh, 1893, we constructed our first concrete pavement in the US. In 1936, our massive concrete construction, Hoover Dam, that's one of our major landmarks. Now, question is, if the Roman concrete was so good, why did we change? Like, why from this durable material, now we are using this modern material? The reason is our demand. Our demand has significantly increased. Now we need a lot of concrete. 
and we cannot rely on volcanic ash anymore. Not just we need a lot of concrete, we need concrete that can give us high strength and also it can give us faster strength. So that's, that's the major point why we had to change. But again, uh, the driving factor was the demand for concrete was increasing, was increased, and again, it's, it's continual, uh, continuously increasing. So how much concrete do we actually need? Um, so some statistics here, we basically use 25 billion tons of concrete every year. Um, it might surprise you, but for any society, concrete is actually the second most widely consumed material after water. And again, if you're surprised, look around you. All of our infrastructures are made out of concrete, mostly concrete. Our bridges, buildings, pavements, everything. And this demand for concrete is, is related to our rate of urbanization. We are developing, so we need more concrete. So um, again, uh, we are using this modern concrete now because our demand has significantly increased. But why do we see the problems in modern concrete or what are the challenges we have? So let's look at our simple Portland cement concrete and let's compare it with our Roman concrete. What is the difference here? Portland cement concrete, it's a very simple material. We basically have three major ingredients. We have Portland cement, then we use with fresh water and aggregate. Eventually we get some sort of slurry that we can use to construct the varieties of the structure. Comparing with Roman concrete, what is the difference here? Two major difference. Number one, instead of volcanic ash, we have started using this manufactured material that is Portland cement. Also, Roman concrete, they use sea water. Here we are using fresh water. Now, because of these two ingredients, number one, our uh, durability performance is not that good. I mentioned that already like in the initial pictures or slides. But another major concern for us is the sustainability issue. What happens is that this Portland cement, this is produced from limestone and silica at a very high temperature. Specifically, we produce at 1450 degrees Celsius. Due to this high production temperature, we have uh, uh, during this process, we have the carbon dioxide emission and also it requires a lot of energy. So due to this Portland cement, high manufacturing temperature, eventually we say that if we are producing one ton of Portland cement, that is actually responsible for one ton of carbon dioxide. And I already discussed that we need to use a lot of concrete to um, ensure that we are developing, constructing all those structures. So if we consider both of these factors, our cement and concrete industry is actually responsible for eight to nine percent of global man-made carbon dioxide emission. And uh, recently now that we are worried about negative effects of carbon dioxide emission, climate change, we realize that this Portland cement, we somehow we have to reduce the carbon footprint of this material. Another uh, major concern we have is that our cement industry um, is the most energy intensive of all the manufacturing industry in the US. And this is simply because the amount of concrete we are using and also the temperature, 1450 degrees Celsius temperature we need for the production. That's about the carbon dioxide emission. Another major concern for our Portland cement concrete is the uh, fresh water consumption. Again, fresh water scarcity is a growing problem. We do not have that problem in the US yet but several parts of the world, they are already facing this type of uh, freshwater scarcity problem. And basically, just to produce concrete, we need to use um, fresh water that is equivalent to the domestic use of 145 million residents. This is also similar to our 9% of global annual industrial water withdrawal. So that's a very high fresh water demand. Uh, finally, not the last part, but again, uh, in modern concrete production, we are using a lot of aggregate. We are basically using approximately 10 billion tons of natural aggregate. This is not a problem in the US yet. However, in several parts of the world, we are already seeing that we are running out of sand or good quality of aggregate. And all of these headlines are from last two or three years. So uh, this is a problem that's growing right now. OK, so now that we learned about Roman concrete and we learned about the modern concrete, let's compare their performance. OK, so we already talked about the durability and that's the main reason why people get attracted to Roman concrete. 
but there are other reasons too, as you can see. First of all, in modern concrete, we are using this Portland cement, which requires a very high production temperature. So it has significantly higher carbon footprint. Whereas Roman concrete, they use natural material and uh, the carbon footprint is significantly lower. Modern concrete, we have to use fresh water. Our standard says that uh, this is drinkable water that, I must, uh, that we have to use to get better performance. And fresh water scarcity is a problem. Whereas Roman concrete, it was produced using seawater and we have plenty of seawater. In case of aggregate, modern concrete, we must use good quality of aggregate. Whereas Roman concrete, not only they used poor quality of aggregate, they actually capitalized that and they used it to improve the performance of concrete. Finally, the service life. After all of this environmental effect, the modern concrete, if it lasts for 100 years, that, that's kind of like, a, we are very happy. That's our dream um, criteria. Whereas Roman concrete, it already survived for 2000 years and without showing any major problem. So when we have shorter surface life, it means we need to have higher, we will have higher maintenance costs. And also for a fixed duration of time, we are going to use a lot of concrete. So again, just the takeaway point from this uh, comparison of modern concrete and Portland cement concrete. Modern concrete is cheap. You can easily get it in even from Walmart or Home Depot. You can buy it. It's versatile. You can use uh, to construct different types of structure, but it has poor durability performance compared to a Roman concrete. And also it comes with a significantly high environmental burden. And that is the reason why we we need to go back and see what our ancient Roman engineers actually did and what we can learn from them to improve our this current material because uh, this current material is not is not providing uh, good durability or sustainability. So basically what we are doing here is that um, we have this ancient perfect material Roman concrete and we have this modern concrete that's satisfying our current demand. We want to kind of march this technology and we want to develop a new material. That's our goal. We want to develop this new type of construction material which will provide us extraordinary durability like Roman concrete and also sustainability and resiliency. And during this process of reproducing Roman concrete, we also want to understand how, how those different ingredients actually reacted and what are the phases that form at what point of their life cycle they actually formed and so on. So the end product of this project is going to be, we will have a new uh, type of material inspired by Roman concrete. And we are calling it recreated Roman concrete. But because it's a material development process, we have to follow certain stages. So in this case, we are doing a bottom up stage. So um, basically what we are doing, we are starting from the nano to micro scale. So basically um, in Roman concrete, I already mentioned that the extraordinary performance is coming from certain mineral phases, the microscopic phases. So we are looking into the reaction of this uh, artificial system and we are making sure that we get exactly similar reaction product as that of Roman concrete. And also we are monitoring how different environmental conditions such as uh, presence of seawater affecting the formation of those phases. Once we get the recipe to form those specific mineral phases, then we move one scale up and we add aggregate. Then we look into the performance of mortar and concrete and once we satisfy the criteria for strength and durability, we do the full scale experiment and we focus on the life cycle analysis, carbon footprint analysis, and so on. So uh, that's what uh, has been going on in this project. Now the first challenge and why we're not producing exactly the Roman concrete. Now we can produce Roman concrete, but the challenge is Roman concrete was produced using volcanic ash from a particular location. And I, I showed you that quote from the ancient text. Problem is we do not have that volcanic ash available um, in the US. So it's difficult for us to reproduce exactly the same Roman concrete. Our first challenge is that we need to figure out an alternative uh, raw material that will give a similar performance as that of volcanic ash. And also keep in mind that um, in modern days, our demand for concrete has significantly increased. So we have to pick a material that is easily available. And 
And here I'm showing the alternative candidates that uh, we can use. Again, the last one here is cement. So we use 4,000 million tons of cement every year. Alternatives we have, um, if you work with concrete before, you might have heard these uh, names like coal fly ash, fly ash from coal power plant, or slag or silica fumes, so on. But the amount of these raw materials available is very low compared to our Portland cement. So this cannot satisfy our demand for concrete. The only other material that can actually satisfy our demand is clay. So um, that's why clay is the only potential option um, that we can use to recreate this concrete. Now, clay, it again has different types of minerals. It can have kaolin clay, montmolinite, elite, different, um, different types of groups. Usually we say that the kaolin clay is the best quality of clay for construction material. But in the US, you can see that the deposit of clay is, um, kaolin clay is not that significant. It's kind of limited. But if you focus on impure or blended clay, we have plenty of that available in the US. So in this project, we decided to focus on the impure or blended clay minerals so that once it is developed, we have enough raw material to produce concrete. Now you might ask that, OK, clay is not, it doesn't give us a strength, uh, not enough to replace concrete. And that's correct because clay minerals are crystalline. These crystalline minerals are non-reactive. But what we can do, we can heat this clay at a high enough temperature, usually 750 to 900 degrees Celsius. We call it calcination. So during this calcination process, it actually um, goes through dehydroxylation process and eventually it forms like amorphous material. That amorphous material, it has uh, similar characteristics as that of volcanic ash. Now, depending on the clay mineral, uh, we can have different um, calcination temperature. So we select the temperature, we burn it at that temperature, and then here I'm showing the extra diffraction pattern. Uh, the black figure here is the raw calcium mineral, and this is after calcination, which is amorphous. So we're expecting this is reactive and similar to volcanic ash. Now, you might ask me that volcanic uh, Roman concrete, it was produced using volcanic ash, which was natural. Here we are heating up the clay at like 900 degrees Celsius, so it will require energy. So how we balance the sustainability? So uh, the answer is that yes, this is a high temperature, but again, modern concrete, it requires some 1450 degrees Celsius. So we are not exactly becoming as sustainable as Roman concrete, but basically we are balancing between our ancient material and our modern concrete. We are somewhere in between. So this is how we get our raw material, and then we, um, produce our samples. And our sample production is uh, we follow recipes from those ancient books. And again, I mentioned in those ancient books, they talked about the ratios like uh, for volcanic ash to slate line ratio, seawater content and so on. And we are following the same recipe here, except instead of volcanic ash, we are using this calcium clay. So we mix seawater, calcium clay and slick lime and we produce different types of sample depending on what we are looking at. So uh, let me show some results. This slide, it looks technical, lots of plots, so stay with me. What we have here is a uh, heat of reaction. So whenever you mix volcanic ash with slick lime or you mix uh, calcium clay with lime, it, uh, it will participate in pozzolanic reaction. Pozzolanic reaction is an exothermic reaction, so it releases heat. And by monitoring the heat, we can actually understand that how fast it's reacting or how slow the reaction is and so on. And we tried different batches. So let's look at this first plot here. We tried different batches. Um, don't put so much attention into the ideas. It's just different ratios of the clay mineral. And what we see from here that this combination of clay, lime and seawater, it has a um, good amount of heat release. That means it's participating in the reaction and something is forming inside the matrix. Uh, the next plot here is showing the heat flow. This was interesting for us because it shows like at what point we start forming the reaction product and we saw that majority of the reaction happened around uh, within 40 hours and so. And the last plot, we are again showing the reaction rate, but instead of seawater, we added fresh water. Now, comparing the first plot and third plot, what we see is that um, 
when we are adding seawater, there is a significant amount of heat release, whereas in case of fresh water, the heat release is not that high. What does it mean? It means that for this system, seawater is playing an active role. It's kind of like an activator, which is making the reaction faster. This was interesting finding for us because from the previous work, um, other researchers, they have been saying that the Roman concrete microstructure, it changed because of the seawater. Seawater is controlling the mineral formation. And from our work, it simply confirms that he has presence of seawater. It definitely improves the reaction rate. And so we expect that it will also control the type of mineral phases we are forming. Another factor that we are, um, again, so we are here developing a new type of material that um, cementitious material. So we need to focus on the chemistry of the cement and how it's reacting. So another factor that we are looking at is the calcium hydroxide or slate line or Portland that consumption. It's just different terminology for the same ingredient. And for that, we are using thermogrammetric analysis where we heat the sample at a particular temperature, then calcium hydroxide decomposes. And from that, we uh, measure how much calcium hydroxide we have in the system. This is important for us because um, the consumption of calcium hydroxide, it also indicates how fast our system is reacting. And also, usually the presence of calcium hydroxide, we say that it's not good for the durability. So basically what we see from here is that if we're using two is to one post line to line, that is calcium plate to line ratio, we may get some unreacted Portland light in the system, even after 56 days of curing, soaking it in seawater. But for all other ratios, um, the consumption of calcium hydroxide was very fast. Now, it's not just calcium hydroxide consumption. Some of the calcium hydroxide will also leach out into the system because the samples are fully soaked in seawater. And um, we are also looking at the strength of the system. As a civil engineer, that's where um, we are interested in getting adequate strength. So basically what we see is that for this new type of material, um, we are calling it recreated Roman concrete. For the mortar or paste sample, we get around 2000 PSI after seven days of curing. This strength is not as high as our modern cement concrete, Portland cement, but again, it satisfies um, one of the category of the Portland cement. That means we can use it for certain applications. However, uh, we still need to optimize the system to improve its uh, mechanical performance. Next, we also looked into the uh, mineral phase formation for this type of recreated Roman concrete system. This is important for us because, again, remember in Roman concrete, we had this particular mineral phases and we want to see similar phase formation in our recreated system too. Um, because we said that the durability of Roman concrete is because of those phases. To monitor the mineral phase formation, we are mostly using X-ray diffraction and you can see the plots here. But in summary, uh, what we realize is that this new type of system, it contains a lot of hydrocalumite. It contains uh, philipsite, ephraimite. So these are the phases that we have also seen in case of our Roman concrete. We have also seen a tiny peak of tobermorite, um, but also we need to investigate further. Uh, we, we also realize that this type of system, um, this is mostly amorphous. So the quantitative analysis shows that it's almost uh, 75 to 80% amorphous ingredients and all of this crystalline minerals are only around 20%, 25% so on. So to understand how this amorphous phase is reacting or evolving, we are um, using nuclear magnetic resonance spectra for silicon and aluminum. So what does it show us? Um, all of these clay minerals that we are using, these clay minerals are aluminum silicates. So if you see these uh, bluish tetrahedrons on the tops, these are silicate tetrahedrons. And these whitish blocks here, this is aluminum octahedrons. Depending on the clay mineral type, they are arranged in different ways. We did the test for kaolin and mothmolinite, and this is the NMR spectrum. Based on the spectrum, we can understand how it is arranged. Then once we mix this calcium clay with seawater and lime, basically there is a dissolution process and this aluminum and silicate tetrahedrons, it gets separated. After that, it kind of rearranges itself and forms some new reaction product. So this is the NMR spectra of the reaction product. But basically what we saw is there is a layer like of material formation. 
uh, these tetrahedrons and aluminum octahedrons. So this is typical of uh, calcium aluminum silicate hydride gel. In addition to that, we have seen this highly polymerized phase, uh, which is known as the geopolymer gel phase. And finally, since we are using some new material, um, this is our recreated Roman concrete and we have our ancient Roman concrete here. We are just comparing side by side, like what is the difference? Now, in case of Roman concrete, it mainly contains, um, again, these are just showing different arrangement of silica Q1 to Q3. That basically means Roman concrete mostly contains calcium aluminum silicate hydride gel, which is this layer type of material, layers of silicates and aluminates. In our this heat produced system, we have that layer type of material, but in addition to that, we are forming this polymerized phase that is geopolymer gel. So in terms of silica, yes, we have similar microscopic phases as Roman concrete, but we also have some additional products. Finally, we looked into um, also aluminum in NMR and that again, just to understand what is happening with the aluminum phases, as I mentioned, clay is mostly aluminum and silicates. So we want to understand what is happening there. Um, so again, in calcium, uh, sorry, calcium clay, we mostly have aluminum in tetra, pentra and octahedron position. So after our reaction with seawater and lime, it forms a highly crystalline material, it forms hydrocalamite and detrinite. In addition to that, it also forms a CSH gel phase, so it tells us about how those silica and aluminum are arranged. Now, after this XRD and NMR, uh, we kind of know that, okay, the reaction products are similar. However, the relative distribution of those mineral phases, we are still looking into that, the proportion of different phases. But in addition to that, we looked into the morphology because we want to see those needles and plates which can actually bridge the crack and um, act like micro reinforcement so it can improve the performance. And we have seen some of those um, like Philips site which has uh, this type of morphology, a fingered needles, some of the plate shapes, we have seen those. However, we still need to investigate um, if it is really providing us the extraordinary durability performance or not. And when we are running these experiments, it's also helping us to understand that at what point we, we can see these type of mineral phases in our ancient Roman concrete. And our work suggests that some of these phase formation, it takes as long as 56 days. And after that, we, we start um, forming these minerals. So that's most of the experimental results and our previous findings about Roman concrete that I have for you today. Um, so let me summarize. So ancient concrete, uh, Roman concrete, this is a highly durable and sustainable material compared to Portland cement concrete. We are mostly aware of the durability part, but sustainability is also significantly better compared to what we have now. So we want to mimic this technology and produce concrete for our modern application. The challenge is that we do not have volcanic ash, so we have to find alternative sources of raw material. And our work, we are uh, saying that if we use calcium clay, we can produce similar type of product. Our ongoing and future work, so it's uh, this project, we like we have been working on it for last few months, basically. So we are still trying to understand this Roman concrete, how the microstructure actually changed because of the seawater with time. The durability performance, we still need to look into that. We still need to um, investigate the life cycle performance. But again, um, I just want to point out that where we are going actually. And as you have seen that this type of material we are already producing, it has around 2000 PSI of strength. Um, we want to optimize that. But our final application sector for now, we are focusing on the coastal structures where our concrete is continuously exposed to seawater. Um, so coastal bridges, columns, so on. We are also thinking about breakwater application and also artificial reefs. So that's the future application and acknowledgement. This project is funded by DARPA Young Faculty Award. So I'm very grateful to them for this project. And of course, my uh, PhD students and my undergraduate students uh, who are actually working in the project. So um, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you much, much. Uh, Dr. Ashraf. Uh, to the audience, uh, you know, you heard a fantastic uh, presentation and I'm sure you have several questions. Uh, 
there is a Q and A uh, uh, option on Teams. Uh, so if you have any questions, please go to the Q and A option, type in your questions, and uh, once I see them, I will read them out uh, to Dr. Astroff, and uh, she will help uh, answer some of them. So while this is happening, I have a few questions of my own. Uh, so uh, you know what struck me. Uh, when you started giving the presentation is that these Roman structures are 2000 years old and they are withstanding 2000 years of, uh, I guess, uh, uh, all kinds of climatic effects and so on. But uh, why do we need 2000 year old structures? I mean, uh, you know, in the modern world, uh, things change, things get demolished, new structures come up. So yes, I can understand for a few artifacts that you want to preserve, you need that kind of longevity. But uh, do you have a good uh, explanation for why such uh, time spans are important for concrete structures? Yeah, um, so we do not need 2000 years, but the challenge is that our modern concrete, it's, it barely survives for 50 years or so. And when we have the shorter service life, it means that it is start showing the distresses, so the maintenance cost is going to be very high. We want to aim for a longer service life only because uh, we will be able to reduce the maintenance cost. And also for a fixed time period that says that um, we will have lesser consumption of concrete, so it's, it's more sustainable. Um, but yeah, I understand that let's say after 100 years our demand change, we want to demolish a concrete. Yes, we can do that, but within that 100 years, we do not want to spend millions of dollars just for the maintenance. So that's right. the purpose, yeah. And uh, of course, by durability, you it is uh, that's a different metric compared to strength, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. how does uh, this ancient concrete compares with uh, Portland cement concrete in terms of, I guess, uh, load bearing capacity, tensile strength and so on. Yeah, uh, that's that's a very good question. Um, so for modern concrete, our demand has significantly changed. So some of the concrete we have like ultra high performance concrete or ultra high strength concrete. Uh, compared to Roman concrete, it will definitely provide us like a significantly higher strength. But for most of our applications like pavements or some other minor application, we do not need extremely high strength concrete. Uh, the Roman concrete, it has moderate strength that we can use for our majority of our applications. After high strength, one would expect that we need it for construction of major long span bridges or high rise buildings. And there are not so many structures like that. So in summary, uh, the answer is yeah, Roman concrete, it will have lower strength compared to Portland cement concrete, but even with this low or moderate strength, there are uh, plenty of applications. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was curious to know about uh, uh, whether you have information about other kinds of ancient uh, mm -hmm. concretes besides Roman concrete. I would think that uh, you know, the Roman civilization was one of several in the ancient world, right? So yeah. can you can you say something about other parts of the world uh, where uh, some variety of concrete was being used and what were yeah. their, their characteristics? Um, some of the other, like again, I do not have very detailed information, but um, I read a few papers on that. One of the ancient, another ancient technologies, uh, the concrete used in China ancient uh, Chinese structures. And uh, there are lots of interesting uh, stories, but um, based on how much I remember right now, again, forgive me if I was wrong, but basically they used line based binder and they used um, one very interesting application. They used animal blood for admixture that actually improved their durability. Um, so that's one type of ancient material. We also heard about like in Indian culture, they mainly used terracotta, that is burnt clay type of material. So that's another interesting material. So yeah, there are different types of material in those uh, ancient cultures, and many of those are performing very well uh, even today. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Ashraf, I just wanted to tell you that uh, you are having a lot of uh, uh, messages uh, praising your presentation today. They found it wonderful, so you should be happy. 
Um, <laughs> but to continue on with some of the questions. Uh, so uh, when you say volcanic ash, right? So is that different from volcanic rock? Because there is volcanic rock everywhere, right? I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, so so what's the difference between ash and rock? Well, uh, so well, the similarities both of these coming from the volcanoes, right? During the eruption, the basic difference is in the particle sizes. Volcanic rock it might also contain fragments of lava, which may not be reactive. Uh, but again, aggregate if it if it contains like pumice type of porous aggregate that is also reactive and good. Volcanic ash is basically that fine powder coming out of the same process. And because it's fine powder, we can use it as a um, as binder, like mix it easy with water and it reacts faster. Um, so yeah, ash and aggregate coming from the same process is different particle size and sometimes the reactivity is also different. But if you take a volcanic rock and use a crusher to make a fine uh, you know, sand out of it, will it have the same properties as volcanic ash? Yes, yes. Uh, so pumice, that is a porous aggregate. We actually sometimes take the pumice and grind it to get the reactivity and use it in our modern concrete. Mm -hmm. Challenge is that if we want to grind that amount of uh, volcanic aggregates, it's going to take a lot of energy. So that's uh, that's kind of a challenging part. And again, if we have lava fragments, that's that will give some other degree of challenge. I see. Mm -hmm. How do you? Uh, so uh, in your recreated process, right? Uh, you are uh, trying to mimic, uh, sort of trying to strike a balance, right, between uh, Roman concrete and mm -hmm. uh, modern concrete, mm -hmm. because you obviously cannot take the natural ash that is pretty hard to get. So yeah. you're trying to create it through this, uh, I don't know what you called it, uh, calcination process, uh, or something like that, sorry. Uh, so uh, clearly there are many parameters you can tweak in this process, right? So so does it mean that uh, you can produce a complete spectrum of different kinds of concretes based on, uh, you know, I guess different needs uh, of construction and uh, different uh, uh, requirements uh, of sustainability and carbon footprint? Uh, mm -hmm. So how much of control do you have in this process? Um, so that's a very good question. And that's um, one of the things that Right now we are considering, but basically right now we just um, we are trying to produce this material and because it's a recreated system, we are trying to understand the material. Okay. But eventually, depending on the clay mineral types, we are expecting that we will be able to get different performance levels. Uh, but we are actually too early in the project to say about that. We are, we are still trying to learn the uh, material itself. Um, eventually, we might be able to get that is spectra. OK, uh, so let me just read out a few comments from the audience. Uh, these are not really questions, but these are comments. Uh, so we have uh, Rakib saying great talk. Happy to be a part of this work. Thank you, Rakib, for contributing to this work. Uh, somebody anonymous, uh, wonderful presentation, Dr. Asraf. Another anonymous, wonderful work. Thanks for the presentation, Professor Asraf. Then uh, Rossi says, thanks for the presentation. I learned a lot from this work. Thanks for being here and thanks for being able to meet you. So, mm -hmm. so I just wanted to share some of this with you. So to the audience, if you have any other questions uh, for Dr. Asraf, uh, now is a good time to uh, write them in the chat. So I'm going to ask her one more question and give her give you time to ask any more questions if you like. And after that, we will uh, uh, you know, wrap up the presentation. So uh, the question I had really is, uh, you know, if you wanted to look at the common denominator in all these concretes, uh, to me it appears to be three things, right? So some sort of natural product like clay or sand or something like that. Mm -hmm which is of course very abundantly available. So I can imagine any of the ancient civilizations trying to use what is available in the soil. 
but the other common thing well the other common thing is water which is also <laughs> available so i can understand them naturally trying to use it but the third thing i found very intriguing is the use of lime lime is not the first uh, sort of commonly available thing that you think of right mm -hmm. yet it was independently uh, you know experimented with i guess in different parts of the world in the ancient world right mm -hmm. why do you think uh, lime plays such an important role in concrete and how did this ancient people discover it um well so again that's a very good question and it's correct that we uh, used to have lots of sand and fresh water uh, we are facing some scarcity it's coming up but uh, we had that availability in terms of lime what i understand is that this ancient uh, culture they were doing different trials to get enough binding of the material or enough strength lime actually comes from a very common source too it's if you burn limestone or shells uh, it produces lime and i think that was the easiest material that they could get uh, which would provide some strength or binding capacity to the material. And we saw that even for Portland cement, our modern cement, we actually use this limestone to burn and then uh, get some sort of lime. So this this lime or limestone, it is also widely available. And that's why uh, to get the strength, they come up with this recipe. And again, it's common in different, uh, different cultures, but that's the most available material they had. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, we have a few more new questions from the audience, so I'm going to read them out to you. Uh, so a question from Daniel, would this recreated reinforced concrete liquid require less reinforcement than modern concrete? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Um, that's a very good question. Now, short answer is that I still do not know. The long answer is that eventually, if we get those micro uh, microscopic phases that can provide micro reinforcement, then we may be able to reduce the requirement of reinforcement. We may be, uh, but if not, if we get similar type of um, uh, behavior as a modern concrete, then it will require same amount of reinforced uh, concrete. Uh, so the short answer is, is that yeah. Um, we are too early in this project to comment on that actually. Okay. But that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. So another question from uh, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Besides the difficulty in sourcing the exact same ingredients that ancient Romans used and possibly the speed of production, does ancient concrete have any other major downsides? We, we may have talked about it already, but uh, maybe you want to answer this question again. Mm -hmm. um, so the so main, what, what are the downsides of uh, Roman concrete versus uh, modern concrete? Mm -hmm. Well, so Roman concrete, uh, number one, the strength is one of the major factor. We are, uh, Roman concrete will provide us lower strength compared to the Portland cement. But also one of the things that uh, we haven't explored is the reinforcement corrosion. In modern concrete, we use a lot of reinforcement and we uh, usually we tend to be very careful about the corrosion of those reinforcement. In Roman concrete, um, when exposed to seawater, it's actually using a lot of chlorides. So we do not know how it's going to affect the corrosion behavior of the reinforcement. Um, that's a big unknown at this point. But the major limitation comes from, uh, I believe, the strength so far is not as high as our um, modern concrete. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to read out a few more comments. These are not exactly questions, but uh, I think it's, it's uh, definitely you deserve to hear them. Um, so there is a, a comment from Roman Harrington. <laughs> mm -hmm. the first name is Roman. So the comment is, if it's Roman, it has to be good, right? Great, great presentation. Thank you for your very insightful comments. <laughs> and uh, another one from uh, our very own uh, Dr. Abul Mali. Mm -hmm. Wonderful presentation. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Thank Asraf. You. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, I don't see any other comments at this point. So, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for doing a fantastic presentation. I think all of us learned a lot. We enjoyed it. 
And uh, to the audience, uh, you can see how these brown bags are growing these days. Uh, they're very exciting. Please spread the word around. Make sure that you and your friends continue to hear these in the future. Thanks, everybody, and thanks, Dr. Asraf. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.